Okay, thank you. Welcome. Welcome to uh, Living Word Worship Center Wednesday night teaching week one, year 2022 already. <laughs> so we're going to uh, look at a, a simple and uh, could be brief, could be a little little longer, whatever we go, as wide and deep as seems good. The goal here is to learn, learn the things that always point to the person of the Lord Jesus and, of course, to our Father God. The idea is not study for study's sake, but we're learning of a person. And we have such a wonderful opportunity of which I'm so grateful for here just to come in and do nothing else hardly but just look into the word with no real hard clock ticking on us except the clock that ends the class so we'll go as long or as short as we need to the idea is as the scripture says above all things get your, get your understanding or uh, all things are subsequent to understanding. It doesn't matter how much you teach, how much you attend class. The idea is to understand what you are receiving. With all you're getting, get understanding. So the idea, the challenge in all teaching is to reduce teaching to a simple, easy lesson that everyone can see at a glance to make it as easy and clear as possible so we're gonna we're gonna this is kind of a uh, a a lesson i guess you could say or a study in the book of ephesians a little bit predominantly and not just exclusively that but we're going to be using some of this text here especially from the first couple of chapters and just different aspects of god's people what we call seven pictures of God's people. And so primarily, our focus here for the next uh, few weeks, however long it is, our focus will be on the people of God collectively as a body of believers rather than just on Christians as individuals. And so there's, 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 a, there's a little bit different perspective we see ourselves, of course, in light of God's word, but it's important that we see ourselves in the context of all the other people that are the people of God, of course. So primarily, we want to look at the, the body rather than the individual, if you will. Uh, so, but however, let me repeat this or emphasize this, we must never underestimate the importance of each member in God's purposes on earth. Every person is essential. There are no unessential or unimportant members in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, God has arranged the members of the body, every one of them, according to his design. So nothing is coincidental or by chance. It still is remarkable to me, just to stand here and to look out through here and, and to have almost an overwhelming emotion, almost, that God particularly, specifically chose us uniquely, just us, for this moment, this time, and this place. Why weren't we born 100 years ago or 100 years from now in a different country? But he chose us specifically who we are to be, where and when, in order to fill out, fulfill his purposes for our being here. In order for that to work effectively as God desires, then it all works together. As the book of Romans says, all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Every moving part is different from 
every other moving part but necessary to facilitate the overall body of believers. It's like if you just think of parts in an engine. Every part in that engine is an essential part. All of these parts are moving together simultaneously. As long as every part functions correctly and is in time and has all that it needs and is in tune and so forth, as long as everything is good, then the engine will run good. If one part breaks, then the whole engine is no longer good until that part is repaired. We are parts, individuals, of the engine that God has in the earth at this time. So we're essential. Not more essential than others, but certainly not less. Okay, so God's Word, sometimes we describe it as a mirror which reflects the heart of man. When the when the, when the unlearned, I'll say, who really don't have a relationship with God, when they look in the mirror, all they see is, is a reflection in the glass of a physical being. But when we look into the Word of God, we look beyond that. We see that there's more to us than meets the natural eye. And the Word of God reflects what's inside of us, not just what's on the outside. And it doesn't just show where the dirt is. It shows how to wipe it clean. That's the difference. So 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. This is the pre-qualifier for all judgment. Since God sees the man's heart and we do not, then all judgment is left to him and not to us. It's not our call. We don't know what's in people's hearts. We don't know where they came from. We don't know what the issues are. We don't know any of these things, but God does. That's why we are not called to be judges or juries, certainly not executioners. We are called to aid and abet all those who need anything that we can supply for them. So the outward appearance is almost never accurate as a first impression. I, time and time again, we see somebody, we meet them for the first time, and we get a certain impression of them, and it might go a little bit this way or a little bit that way. And later on, when we get to really know them better, we realize we were wrong. This is not who they are. This is who they are. And usually better than what we... What we, the first impressions can be deceptive because they're based totally and completely on the outward appearance. Nowhere is that more prevalent than in organized or institutionalized religion. I can say in my life anyway, my personal experience, in my small frame of reference, things are far better than they used to be when I first became a Christian years ago, like three decades and something ago. Outward appearance was everything. I mean, <laughs> there's some places you just don't show up if, if you don't look right. If you don't look like they do, uh, you'll be, if they let you in, you, you'll always be an outsider or a visitor. I don't care if, if you've been there 20 years until you look like them and begin to conform to their image of whatever outward appearance you're supposed to be carrying. Until you do that, you'll never be accepted in those places. But I will say this, if, if the church has made progress in any area, I believe it's here more than any, any other place I can think of myself. There are numerous places, many places that anyone can attend now or go to or just show up and be treated rather fairly where that has not always been the case. I, re 
not, not to belabor this minor point, but when this when we first moved here and we're first building here and the build, you know in the early stages of of a church life basically and so forth, things were uh, the building was under construction, the parking lot was not in yet, you know, like that early on. So I remember Denny and the, maybe his wife Marge and maybe a couple of other guys. They showed up on a Sunday morning on their motorcycles. They're going to shock us. Back then, it was called a church crash. That was just to shock religious folks by bikers showing up at their church on Sunday morning. <laughs> so, you see, a lot has changed, you know. Now, now uh, you know, we have special events just for that. We ride bikes inside the church, and, and it, 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 it just now, it's just normal. It's just normal either way. Uh, you know, if you don't have to, but you're allowed to. And this is kind of the position I feel of uh, the freedom that we have in the Spirit, in the Lord, to be this way. And I, I really... I really, I guess, as much as I can judge myself, I feel this is one area that the Lord has really graced me with, is that I do not in any way um, look down on people or belittle people because of their outward appearance, or do I consider them anything other than a guest for whom I'm just unbelievably grateful that they would come. I don't see them any differently as anyone else. I just don't see people that way. I think that, I think that is a quality that it really ought to be in all Christians, but for sure essential in any leaders at all or anybody who is, re, is a reflection on the church itself. When we... And it's, it's not easy, I don't mean to take this lightly either. Depending on people's backgrounds, what they were raised in, the kind of churches they were raised in and so forth, uh, it's very easy to have this in your DNA, literally in your blood, and there's nothing you can do, it's just in you. You automatically see this and that. You autom and, but the one, thing, the one thing that I would point out that's important to know is that the things that a generation or two ago people were criticized for are now ma mainstream and we don't think a thing about it. So that shows you that it was really wrong and judgmental and not really of God, but more of a stumbling block in the spiritual world than anything else. So when I, early on when I first became a Christian, this is a while ago, um, you know, I've I, I mentioned this once, and I'll just mention this and then move on. But it was a young church, and, and uh, people were, you know, people were coming in, they were being saved and things like that. And then, if, but if they came in, like if a man came in like with long hair and a leather jacket and stuff like that, and he came because he wanted to be saved or be a Christian or whatever, he would be allowed to do that, but then... He would, then he would be instructed to get a haircut when he left there. And I don't mean that to be cruel or anything. That's literally true. I know it is. I mean, I, would, I can tell you it is. Um, but this is just lack of knowledge, really. It's not ill intent. It's not evil people. It's really just ignorance. Not knowing this has nothing to do with anything. The opposite is true. This is the this is the one place, <clears throat> you know, where that should <laughs> you should hear anything but that. People turn the TV on; they know they can go on stage at the Grand Ole Opry in their in their cowboy hats, in their jeans with holes in it. Matter of fact, you can't go there without them now. I think that's the uniform. Uh, but it 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 kind of it's it's an embarrassment to us to see how unconditionally accepted people are 
at least on the surface, by outward appearances. That's what we're talking about. As opposed to in the church. You come into the church, if you don't look like the rest of the people, and it depends on the church, um, then there's an issue, and that's not good. I, w I do not want to be held in contempt for that. So, and fortunately, thank God, it's not a part of our assembly. It never has been. Thank God for that. So God looks at the heart, not the outward appearance. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. When we look into the Word of God before we are reconciled to God, before we're saved, it showed us our sinful state. When you first read the Bible, it just goes up one side and down the other if you're like me. <laughs> Everything I read just showed me how little, I, not how little I knew, but how wrongly I knew everything. It's not that we thought we knew everything, but everything we thought we knew, in my case, was essentially the opposite was true. And so that, but I got a real crash course in that early on, and I, I just couldn't stop. But, but I was a person who the Spirit had dealt with and come to and gave me conversion. And it was that same Spirit that is the teacher. And that Spirit humbles a person to where when you read the Bible and it shows you how wrong you are, it doesn't make you mad and you, go, and you leave and go look for some other religion. No, it makes you so glad to find this out. The sooner you know, the better, the better your chances of changing. <laughs> so this is the word of God. But after we're born again, the word shows us that we have be, what we have really become as new creatures in Christ. And we do uh, emphasize this a lot, and, and rightfully we should. The correct image of, of you and me or anyone else is the image that God himself gives and portrays for us. This is who we really are. Every person has sort of an image or idea of who they are and they think they are and they see themselves in a certain way. And then there are other people that see them in a different light and likely a different way altogether that would surprise you to find out about. But the only one who reads you right is God. He knows us like we really are. So if you want that, you go to the Word of God and you have it. So, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And the next verse says, And the new is from God. So the old... The old is gone, the new is come. So what, what, are, what are we talking about? What, what's old that's gone? What's new that's come? When you, when you become a Christian, what's, you know, the obvious things, well, you know, some of the habits, maybe you try to clean, maybe, maybe you try to clean up your language a little and it gets worse. And then, and you try to, and you try to quit these bad habits that, you know, before <laughs> the, the, the general consensus, especially for those who really are not schooled in Christianity, is that Christianity is just two lists. It's a list of things that you do not do if you're a Christian. <laughs> and there's another list that you must do if you're a Christian. So when we look at these lists, and we've, we, we're honest, we just, we don't see any way we can keep either one of them. It's discouraging. It is a stumbling block because it is a false gospel. This is not the gospel. This is backward. This is the cart before the horse. Before you can live a certain lifestyle, don't you have to first of all begin your life? And doesn't life begin at birth? So the Christian's life begins at birth the same way as a natural human being begins at birth. Their lifestyle begins 
at birth. So Jesus said, he didn't say you must do this and that, and there's a list, and check with John and check with Peter. They'll let you know, you know what the rules are. No, he said, be born again. And he said in Matthew 6, 33, I think it was, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the lists have a way of working themselves out. It's important that we begin at the beginning. First things first, be born again. You can keep all the lists you want and think you're doing good. You will never evolve into a Christian. The way a person becomes a Christian, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. The way a person becomes a Christian is the same way you become a human being. You're born into it. You cannot arrive there by any other means. So, but in summary, we say all of those things pass away and all these new things come. We know new habits come, new priorities come, and all this. But the real bottom line, the way I would uh, share it, what passes away is our old identity, who we were. Not what we did but who we were, our name, our reputation, what we're most proud of, the good things that we should have credit for. All of these things pass away and we get a brand new identity. The new man has no identity of his own. The new man now is identified with Christ and Christ only. His identification is with Christ. It doesn't matter now. His, he doesn't defend his reputation from what he used to be. He doesn't, he doesn't still brag about what a bad person or a good person. People talk about, I used to do this and that. All. That identity passed away in Christ, and a new identity comes. So who we are is the only thing and the one necessary thing that we must all give up in order to receive this new identity or this new identification. We're now Christians. The old man passed away. I have a historical memory of the person I was before I became a Christian and if things were mentioned I would remember you know as far as historically accurate and so forth but I have no identification there whatsoever to me that person never existed never existed now this is an experience that is not just optional this is essential this is the beginning this is when a man becomes a new creature in Christ. He is born again. This old person, this old identity passes away. Passes away is a polite way of saying dead and gone. And a new person replaces this old person. Now this person is from God. This is the new creation. This is, this is what Paul, or what the, yeah, Paul is talking about. So, Okay, so let's move on a little bit. Let's go to Exodus chapter 1. Oh, it's so good to be back here in the room. Where have you guys been? been gone this what have you been doing? I will admit, it was nice having a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, where you just, wow, I, I felt funny when Wednesday came around. We have a biological clock. You've been doing this a while. Man, you don't need a calendar. You know what day it is. You feel it coming. But it was good to get a break for a couple of weeks from, you know, from preparation and so forth. It was good. But now we're here. Thank God. Exodus chapter 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all, including Joseph, who was already 
in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and increased rapidly. They multiplied and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. Now, um, God's objective God's objective the primary objectives in redemption is not as I mentioned earlier just limited to an individual basis but a national or actually a universal basis so the objectives of um, redemption or of, of salvation we might say number one is to bring God's people into a personal relationship with himself very few of the Israelites grasped his main purpose in redemption they were more interested in the law things of the law, material blessings, the promised land, natural things. In other words, uh, just, I don't, I don't use this word carelessly, but sort of carnal-minded kind of people. Their, their minds were on things other than the spiritual things, the priority. God's objective with man is, number one, to bring man into a personal relationship with him. Now, we didn't have this manifest yet in the Old Testament, but eventually in the New Testament, of course, that would be through Jesus Christ. So, this, and beyond that, not only is it God's objective to bring us into a relationship with himself, but to make us a peculiar people to himself different from all other people in the earth. So the Israelites um, sometimes are referred to as stubborn or the King James says stiff-necked many times, uh, rebellious. They make all kinds of vows and oaths and promise and, and they break it almost as quick as they make it. So it, it's a... Uh, uh, you know, it's a spotted history here, I guess you could say. But God's idea was to pull a people out from the entire population, to bring a certain group of people out of the whole of the people and make them peculiar or particular to himself, to enter into a personal relationship with him, and also to, you know, I think of the word, if you, if you're, if you use computers very much, there's, a, there's a, a, a setting there where you can personalize things. You can, you, can, you can personalize the kind of typeface or font you want to use and the, type of, and the colors and the backgrounds and all this kind of stuff. You, could, you can make it your personal computer, your personal desktop. Harley Davidson knows all about this. They, they, believe me, they know when you lay that 30 grand or 40 grand or whatever it is down for a new bike now, they know that's just the beginning. Not all, this is going to be more than just a personal relationship with this motorcycle. You had to make this motorcycle your own personal bike. I mean, you had to you had to start changing stuff, adding stuff. I mean, it never ends. You personalize it so that anywhere you see it, oh, that's mine. There'll be you go into a bar, you go into a, a bike rally or anything like that. If you're looking for like a a black Harley, <laughs> believe me, I, I hope you have a better clue than that because <laughs> pretty much like 99 percent of them are, are but. You go down the ranks and down the rows, and you'll find that there's something personal on every single one of them, and the people who own it, they know, and it's been personalized. It has a certain part. A, a, something's, something's theirs. They made it their own. It's just theirs. There's a, maybe it's a special paint or, or this. 
This is the way God personalizes his people. He makes us different, stand out kind of. Not weird in the sense of abnormal, but just unusual in the sense of people know there's something different even if they don't know exactly what it is. We are a peculiar people. And in some, some translations of this, of this text here, the, word, uh, the King James uses the word peculiar. We are his peculiar treasure. And what peculiar means, literally what it meant then, is purchase possession. We belong to him. He bought us. He paid for us. He takes such good care of us that when the rest of the world sees us, we tend to stand out above them. There's something different about God's people. And it's because of what God, it's about the effect that God has and the changes that God incorporates into our lives. It makes us different. So we're different from all other people in the earth in that way. Now, it's not something that we are to put on the outward appearance of. You know, there are some people they want to, I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong, you do what you want. You'll see them coming, they're carrying, you know, like a coffee table sized Bible under their arm. Well, <laughs> I'd say they want everybody to know that they're a Christian. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think everybody should have Bibles and carry them more. But we shouldn't, it, it's not about being different outwardly. It's not about wearing the, the clerical collar or maybe the robes. And there's nothing wrong with that. By all means, it makes life a lot simpler if you do that. You don't have to do what we have to do. <laughs> but it's not about standing out outwardly. There's something different about this person on the inside. There's something different about their personality. Something, thank you, Kim. Thank you, honey. There's something different. There's something that draws you to this person. There's something that makes you feel comfortable enough to be open with them. You trust them. There's something that you bear witness with. There's a spirit that you align with. And, of course, the opposite is true if, if, if there's a contrary type spirit. You know this. This is all subjective, of course, and not to make a big deal out of it. But sometimes you can be around people then just, man, they just really rub you wrong. They, I mean, I mean, they, and they, I mean, it doesn't take just a minute. And, you know, and you, you're doing your best, to, you know, to compensate, for, you know, for all of this. So the spirit that people have you can't hide. And the believer should have the spirit that God has put in us, a humble spirit, but yet brave and courageous as well. Not a fearful spirit, not a critical spirit, but the spirit of that Jesus himself would exhibit. Okay, so God wants to make us his people Peculiar, different. He bought us with his own blood. We know that. And he's chosen us out of a world population to be set aside just for him. We are sanctified for his purposes. Okay, let's read Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us 
in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his presence, in his presence. Now, I don't want to go off on too many tangents here, but more and more I'm noticing this little key phrase within a passage. It says, for he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, before creation. Before. Now, I mentioned this, and I just, I don't know if I should just say it this simply and move on and leave you hanging or not, but never stopped me before. I don't do it. <laughs> but I'm, we are more than we could ever imagine we are as human beings the creation of God. I'll say this to you and leave it with you. We have always been in God. We have, we have only been human beings for a few years. And there's an expiration on that. And then we resume on the other side of humanity. Who we always were. When God molded the body for Adam from the soil, he breathed Adam into this lifeless mannequin of dirt. Well, Adam didn't just begin. Adam's human being just began. The man, Adam, the human, Adam, began about 6,000 years ago. But man has always been in God. And then there's this dimension that we have in Genesis Call the, the, the week of creation, the first week, when the heavens and the earth were created. When the physical realm was manifested as a place for the beings to inhabit to fulfill their destiny. So what if I told you, and what if you believed it? How would you see yourself when you look in the mirror? What if I told you, you didn't just get here 30, 40, 50 years ago. You have never not been. You received this body the moment your father and mother conceived you. Your human being began at that time, at that moment, the moment of conception you didn't begin your physical body. That's what conception is. The beginning of a physical human being in the womb of the mother. So your humanness, your human began then. And it's temporary in this corruptible state. But then briefly after that, corruption lays is put off and the incorruption is put on. Mortal, mortality is laid down and immortality is picked up and then this little brief moment, this little window where, where a human life is, is 
It's just a moment. But you are eternal. You are. So he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And there are many, many, many more uh, inferences to this if you want to just make a, a, a line study on that. But anyway, let me, let me conclude this if I can. So he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his presence. In love he predestined us for adoption as his sons through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the beloved one. In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to bring, now listen to this, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together in Christ. Amen. When Jesus, when the, when the early disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, one of the things he said was, pray that the will of God be done on earth like it is in heaven. Bring heaven and earth in agreement together. We see it here early on. In verse 11, in him we are also chosen as God's own, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything by the counsel of his will in order that we who are the first to hope in Christ, that would be the Jewish people really, would be for the praise of his glory. And he, he, do, he works out his plan according to his own counsel. You remember how he kind of uh, chided Job? And he asked Job, he said, Job, where you want to give me all this counsel? You want to tell me how to do it? <laughs> you want to give me advice? Where were you when I flung the stars in the heavens? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you're talking to? I hold the expanse of the heavens in, my, in the palm of my hand. You're going to advise me? Where were you? It's, it's hilarious, I think. <laughs> and in him, having heard and believed the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you were sealed with a promised Holy Spirit, who is the pledge of our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in your knowledge of him. I ask that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you may know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his, at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Now, here we go. And God put everything under his feet, it made him head over everything for the church. This word church here, um, we'll get to it in just a second, is it means assembly. It's from the Greek word ecclesia, a called out group of people. So he made Christ the head of everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So verse 22, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and made him head over all things for the benefit of the church assembly. So Christ is the head. We are the many-membered body. Okay? Acts chapter 19. Why 
While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior and came to Ephesus. Remember Ephesus, that's where we, we spent a lot of time here. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? No, they answered. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Into what then were you baptized? Paul asked. The baptism of John, they replied. You, cannot, you can only walk in the light that you have. Okay? Paul was questioning them, finding out how... What have you learned? Where, where are you in the Lord? What do you believe? What is your experience up to now? So, no, we, we haven't heard of any, we haven't heard there's such a thing as the Holy Spirit. We were baptized by John into John's baptism. We'll see what it is right here. Paul explained John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. At the time before Jesus, the most anyone could possibly do would be to repent and try to do better. Try harder, in other words. Try harder. Try to do this. Try to do better. Try to, you know, turn over a new leaf. Try to be a better person. All of this stuff. They wanted to be saved. Men have always wanted to be saved. But until Christ did all that he did to purchase redemption, until the finished work of Christ came, men wanted to be saved, but there was no possible way that they could be saved. No matter how hard they tried or how, or how hard they wanted to be or how good their intentions were, no way was made yet. Christ brought the way he became that way okay um, so okay so John's baptism was a baptism of repentance he told the people to believe in the one that's coming after him of course that would be Jesus on hearing this they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul laid his hands on them the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied there were about 12 men in all. Verse 8. Then Paul went into the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But when some of them stubbornly refused to believe and publicly maligned the way, the way meaning the way that Paul was preaching to follow Christ, the new way of Christ, when he preached that, uh, Paul, uh, they maligned what Paul was preaching. So Paul took his disciples and left the synagogue to conduct daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that everyone who lived in the province of Asia, Jews and Greeks alike, heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and the diseases and evil spirits left them. You, you remember, uh, specifically when we do communion, and at any time, but we offer these little envelopes, you know what I'm talking about? This is from Acts chapter 19, and this, I mean, chapter 19, this verse here, verse 11 and 12. Inside this, there's a cloth. And this is referring to this passage here. God did extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs, aprons, or cloths that had touched Paul were taken to the sick and the diseases and evil spirits left them. Now, this is not a magic charm. It's far greater than that. It's a reminder of the miraculous power of Jesus Christ. And inside of that... There he is. I'll just show you. This is the cloth. Okay. This cloth serves as a reminder of this passage in Acts chapter 19 where the power of the gospel, the power of the spirit to heal and to deliver people from evil spirits 
uh, was transferred from Paul to other people as they identified with this power and this miraculous power of God. Also on the back, just as a little extra bonus, Psalms 91.10, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. I don't know why you wouldn't have one of these with you at all times. Be better than that little good luck charm you're wearing. <laughs> all right, okay, verse 13. Now there were some itinerant Jewish exorcists, exorcists, traveling exorcists, who tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those with evil spirits. They would say, I bind you by Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. Eventually, one of the evil spirits answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Oh, oh God. <laughs> then the man with the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. The attack was so violent that they ran out of the house naked and wounded. So the power <laughs> is in the power of God and the power of identifying with Jesus, the name of Jesus, and the power of Jesus. Okay, so <laughs> this is great. I hope you all get something out. You should study this. Lord, if you only knew what was in your Bible, you'd have been reading it years ago. Verse 17. This became known to all the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, and fear came over all of them. So the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many who had believed now came forward confessing and disclosing their deeds, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts, the occult practitioners, you know, the fortune tellers and all this stuff you see, if you want to see, you can, you can go to any bookstore you want and you'll find rows and rows of occult books, this and that. Try to find a Bible in that book, in that store. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books and burned them in front of everyone. When the value of the books was calculated, the total number came to 50,000 drachmas. A drachma was about a day's wage. So 50,000 days wages is quite a bit by any wage. So the word of the Lord powerfully continued to spread and prevail. So you can see the atmosphere uh, in Ephesus at the time. And you know, people, it's, it's almost humorous to see the stuff that Christians whine about today, I'd being persecuted, somebody called them a bad name on Facebook, or some, some kind of tormenting thing like that. They had no idea that what our forerunners have paid for us, and I don't either, but I know what I read, and it makes me uh, not whine about any type of uh, oppression that we would ever see. Okay, so the word of the Lord powerfully continued to spread and prevail. After these things had happened, Paul resolved in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he passed through Macedonia and Achaia. After I've been there, he said, I must see Rome as well. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed for a time in the province of Asia. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way, the Christian way, this new way. It began with a silversmith named Demetrius. Now listen to this. On top of all the occult, you know, stuff. It began with a silversmith named Demetrius who had made silver shrines of Artemis, A-R-T-E-M-I-S, bringing much business to the craftsmen. A lot of uh, big business in this <laughs> fake God stuff. Demetrius assembled the craftsmen along with the workmen in related trades. This is the industry in Ephesus. This is their economy. It's like it's no different than today. Our economy today, every time we find a new way to make money, we legalize dope. Now people carrying every kind of thing they are. They wonder why. Why are people driving so crazy? Well, they could be stoned. <laughs> stoned and distracted. <laughs> and drunk. <laughs> wonder why they're driving so crazy. Wrong ways and red lights and this and that. I'm going to tell you this to go on record with it. Nothing yet. 
I don't believe combined will do as much damage as this government gambling going on now. Every five minutes on TV, you can gamble in your shirt pocket now, on your phone all day long. You don't have to go to the casino. Look at this, there's a hundred ways to win, a hundred ways to win. This is a curse. If there's any such thing as a curse, the more convenient you make this for people, there's no bigger hook than gambling. There is no bigger hook. Once you get that little phone out and get that little app up, and that little gambling app, that little casino app on your phone, and it's just a few bucks here. Oh, we'll match you dollar for dollar for that first thousand dollars. That thousand dollars will cost you your house and your wife, and your kids, and probably your life. The government has blood on their hands like, no, like never before now, and I'm not kidding on this. I'm old enough to remember when the lottery began in Michigan, the 50 cent tickets. We're gonna, oh, this is gonna, this is gonna cover your school taxes, your property taxes. Are you kidding me? These 50 cent lottery tickets, people are stupid. <laughs> we have a stupid government because we have stupid people who elected stupid government. Stupid. You got that right. The Bible says clearly prosperity will destroy. A fool. And then we get this little this little tagline underneath. If you have a problem with gambling addiction, call this number here. <laughs> and right and right after that, it's booze. If uh, drink uh, uh, drink moderately. What is it? What is no? What is it? What is it? Uh, responsibly. Yeah. Yeah. They're always trying to get, sell you some safe way to sin. There's no safe way. The way to sin is death. There's nothing, it's not safe. People are stupid. I said stupid. To accept this as a normal way of life. Nothing's bad as what you see right now, this gambling thing. I'm telling you, this is the worst ever. And I guarantee you, the Christians right now got their pockets full of these apps. And never pay a tithe in their life. So you tell me, what do you think, how do you think they're going to end up? The Bible says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. The righteous ought not be laying out their wealth to the wicked. It doesn't take a genius to figure out. You walk into this trillion dollar building, it's got diamond chandeliers, and some little lady on a crutch and her social security check over here trying to work with one arm on this th thing over here. You tell me who, who's gonna win. They can't pay their rent and buy food and they're going and giving it to somebody who can't, who can't find enough ways to hide the money that they got. This is stupid to allow this sort of thing. It was stupid to legalize dope. I'm not trying to make any more enemies than I already have. I don't think I have any of flesh and blood. I already know that the Bible says we don't wrestle against them. The government would do anything for money, anything for your money, any way to take your money. That's why, they, that's why they're there. That's what they do. That's all they do. Don't be stupid. Don't be a fool. 
This just passed recently, after the dope thing. Now, oh, we got good news this year. We made so much money selling dope last year. Look at all the tax revenue we made. See, everybody was against it. See what a good idea it was? Worship the Most High God. You don't need booze and dope to get high. God's higher, higher still. You sure don't need to be giving your money. I don't know where that came from. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ephesus, Ephesus. It came out of Ephesus. The whole economy was built on this, making these false idols and gods and statues and all this worthless junk. And everybody's employed making it. The Bible says, shame on you, Christians. The people of the world are wiser than you are. You should know better. Where did I leave off here? Oh, yeah. Demetrius assembled the craftsmen along with the workmen in related trades. Men, he said, you know that this business is our source of prosperity. And you can see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in nearly the whole province of Asia, Paul has persuaded a great number of people to turn away. He's, he says, Paul says, you ready for this? Paul says that man-made gods are no gods at all. You hear what he said? He said our gods are not even gods. There's danger not only that our business will fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and her majesty deposed. She who is worshipped by all the province of Asia and the whole world. The goddess Artemis is being criticized by Paul. Paul says she's not even a god. If he keeps doing this, we'll all be unemployed. There goes our fortune. Boy, oh boy. No wonder. When the men heard this, they were enraged and began shouting. Here's what they said. These are so-called intelligent, the tradesmen. When the men heard this, they were enraged and began shouting. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in disarray. They rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Paul wanted to go before the assembly, but the disciples would not allow him. Even some of Paul's friends who were officials in the province of Asia sent word to him, begging him not to venture into the theater. It's too dangerous, Paul. You may, they're all up in arms now. You, you attack their god, their false god. Meanwhile, the assembly was in turmoil. The assembly... Assembly, that's the word we're keying in on. The assembly was in turmoil. Soon, or some were shouting one thing and some another. Most of them did not even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander forward to explain himself, but he motioned for silence so he could make his defense to the people. But when they realized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. All these, the whole town is out in the middle of in the town square shouting for two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. No wonder Paul went to Ephesus. <laughs> Finally, the city clerk quieted, quieted the crowd and declared, men of Ephesus, doesn't everyone know that the city of Ephesus is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Since these things are undeniable, you ought to be calm and not do anything rash. For you have brought these men here, though they have done neither, they have neither robbed our temple nor blasphemed our goddess. So if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and proconsuls are available. Let them bring charges against one another there. But if you're seeking anything beyond this, it must be settled in a legal assembly. Assembly is the first word we're looking at. For we are in jeopardy of being charged with rioting for today's events, and we have no justification to account for this commotion. 
After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. So, God, I can't even read that without getting angry. Deuteronomy 32, 9. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Jacob was changed to Israel. Speaking of the nation, Israel. Okay. The ultimate purpose of God with his people is not to just redeem individuals, but to create a collective people who fulfill his purpose in the earth as only a special group of people can. Jesus' prayer for his followers, his present and future followers, is found in John chapter 17. I'm not asking on behalf of them alone. Jesus is praying to the Father for his disciples who are with him there. I'm not asking on behalf of them alone, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their message. In other words, for those who have already believed who are with me now, I'm praying for them. But I'm also praying for those who will believe later when they hear the message that these have carried out. That all of them, those who are already believers and those that will become believers later, that all of them may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. So that the world may believe that you sent me. The world needs to believe that God sent Jesus. And the way that they will be convinced of that is through these disciples. In verse 23, that they may be perfectly united. So this was his goal. This was his prayer. So that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them just as you have loved me. Amen. How many times have I told you and I, people look at me and it's like it's blasphemy, like I'm blaspheming. I'm telling you again, Jesus is telling them, this is his prayer, this is the truth. God loves you as he loves Jesus. Amen. Not less, not more. Now, now, let that sink in for a second. No one who knows the Lord in any measure would ever doubt or question or even have a passing thought about how much God loves his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus. You just take that for granted almost. You assume that, you know that. That's baked in to the message. But did you also know it's exactly the same for you? You are no less loved. You are the reason God exchanged Jesus for you. He considered that an even trade. That was, an, that was a value, a purchase. That was an irresistible uh, call that God made. He valued us as much as he valued Jesus himself. Jesus was cut off from heaven. He was severed from heaven. He was murdered in the earth by men and went into hell itself with this gospel. Had God not raised him up at his word, as his, at his promise, by Jesus dying, having fulfilled his mission, innocent of all charges, and assuming all guilt for us, perfectly to the last moment, and accomplishing exactly the only possible way that man could be redeemed, when he did that perfectly, then the promise of God raised him from the dead and exalted him into heaven. Amen. Now, if you think this is a token salvation, that God just sweeps stuff under the rug and he's such a good God, he'll let us by with all this, and he won't hold it against us. And we'll... No, it has to be paid. Nobody enters heaven with a debt. The debt either is paid by Christ already on your behalf or you're going the other way. You cannot pay by any other means. 
This is the gospel. God loves you. He wants the world to know that they are loved as much as Jesus is loved himself. That's a remarkable statement. God's plan is to form a collective people, that would be us all together, that will convince the world that Jesus was sent from God just for them. Somehow, I think we, I don't, I don't think we're doing that, that well at making that connection. When they think of us, they think of the lists that I mentioned. Oh man, that's my only day off, Sunday. I can't. Oh, when am I going to mow my grass? And all of this starts. If you worship God first. You'll find time for all these things. I'm telling you, after 40 years, you will. But if you, if all these, if you put all these things first, you will never find time to worship God, and you quit lying to yourself tonight on the first Wednesday of the year. Okay, assembly was the first word I wanted to deal with. It's from the Greek word ecclesia. It ha in a civic sense, it's not a religious word necessarily. In a civic sense, it is a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into a public place. Remember this assembly there in Ephesus where they, came, they called them all out and said, look, you see what's happening here? They're, you know, our, our God is in trouble. And if, if our God is... Uh, uh, you know, discredited. Our livelihood is at stake. What are we going to do for a living if we, can't, if we can't work silver or if we can't make idols and statues? And I get that. It's not an easy thing to lose your livelihood. So it was a civic gathering of people. Now, um, in a Christian sense, it is a gathering for worship in a religious meeting. In other words, a local church service. What you see here on Sunday morning is an ecclesia, a, an assembly, an assembly of Christians gathered together uh, to worship God in a meeting collective. It's also used, the word ecclesia or assembly is also used as the whole body of Christians gathered throughout the world. Sometimes it's referring to all believers in the whole world as an assembly. And also, sometimes it's referred to the assembly of Christians who are already departed and received into heaven. They're already there. The church is made up of members in the earth and in heaven. It's the same church, same place, just different, different address for a while. But Assembly can refer to a local, in, in the Christian sense, a local gathering of believing Christians or a worldwide gathering of Christians or a universal gathering of heaven and earth. So you see, it's quite a broad term and the civic definition. So membership into Christ's assembly is this way. Beginning with Matthew 16, 50. I mentioned before, the way you get membership in the church is the way you got membership into the human race. You're born into it. There is no other way in legitimately. Okay, so the membership in the Christ assembly is this. Matthew 6, 16, 15. Jesus said to them, he's talking to the disciples and he's having kind of a impromptu conversation there. And he asked them all this question, who do men say that I am? And some of them answered and said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah, one of the prophets. Really, they're not sure. But he narrowed it down and he said, well then who do you say that I am to them? And of course, Simon Peter spoke up. When we studied him, we, we learned that he was the mouthpiece of the group. He always spoke for the group. Okay, 
So Simon Peter spoke up and answered this way. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Christ is the anointed one, the Redeemer, the one promised of God, the Savior. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, bar Jonah, or son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You didn't learn this in school. No one taught you this. No one could. There's no place on earth that can reveal to you who Jesus is. There's no seminary that can. There's no university that can. There's no medical school, law school, or any other kind of school that can reveal to you personally who Jesus is. There's only one person who can. That would be our Father in heaven. In other words, it's not an intellectual experience. It is a spiritual one, 100% or no experience. Also, or verse 18, I also say to you, Peter, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, or ecclesia, assembly, and the gates of hell, or Hades, will not overpower it. So it's a perfect way to end with this right here. What is the rock? What is the rock that Jesus builds the church on? Christ builds his church upon the rock of the revelation and the confession that Jesus is the Son of the living God. Amen. What you just saw Peter do, and we'll get break that down a little bit starting next week. The church is built on this and nothing else. We studied the apostles, the foundation. They are the foundation stones underneath in which we stand tonight, and they hold us up. But the membership the living members of the church are added to this rock of revelation. Unless Jesus has been revealed to you by the Father in heaven, no wonder you're struggling in university trying to figure out what's this thing about Jesus. The university has no way to reveal it. They cannot reveal to you what they themselves do not know or have. No man, no flesh and blood can. The revelation of who Jesus is must come by the Holy Spirit from the Father in heaven, period. Stop trying some other way. You are wasting your time. You would die in your sins if you don't hear this. Once you see for yourself and it's revealed and you know in your heart that Jesus is real, once you know that, the next moment when you open your mouth, you've talked your way into heaven forever. Amen? Amen. God bless you and thank you this evening. And uh, if you know what you're doing, we'll see you on Sunday at uh, 11 o'clock. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye for now.